How we doing, friends? Talk to me. See, they know. I'm going to go to this side because y'all, you know, no. <laughs> How we doing? We all right? I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, thank you. I not only love y'all, I like most of y'all. <laughs> My wife and I say that all the time. I, I, I love you and I like you. It matters. There's some times where we say, I love you, but uh, <coughs> we got to work through a few things. <laughs> Mostly me, to be truth. Hi, you, YouTube or Facebook or whoever. Hi. How you doing? Thank you, David. We could really freak them out and be like, zoom in. Zoom out. <laughs> Very glad to be here. Um, my, you know, heart is obviously here with my parents and very 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 grateful to you the church the body for your support in this time and in this season we are standing firm in faith and believing god for all good things yeah yeah and uh, i do believe god gave me a word for this church today it's a word for me first always but a word for you too on paper instead of my usual ipad I decided to fly uh, Frontier Airlines. Well, <laughs> so they, they lure you in with the ticket, which was, yeah. And me, like a cheap date, was just like, okay, you know, went along with it. And then they wanted to charge me more for baggage than the ticket each way. And I was like, mm -hmm. But you can bring a personal item, which means a backpack that you have to stuff into a little thing to make sure it fits so you don't have to pay $68 each way. $68 each way. I was just like, Whoa. okay. So I packed light is what I'm saying, um, but very, very uh, grateful. So if you would bring up the word uh, Mark 5. I'm going to be reading from the NIV for this part, but... Father, we honor you, we honor you, and we bless you, and we thank you for the word, Lord God, that you guide us, Lord God, into all truths, Lord God. I thank you that your word illuminates, Lord God, our lives, Lord. And in a time and in a season of this earth where there is prevalent darkness, Lord, your word is going to stand apart, Lord God, and your people are going to stand apart as we declare the word of the Lord in the public marketplace, Lord in the political sphere, Lord God. We're not going to back down. We're not going to shy away. We're not going to change doctrine, Lord God. But we're going to lift up the name of Jesus in all things. So Mark 5, verse 21, I guess I should set a clock as well. Now some of you all have asked, well, how, how is the family? Are they here? They are not here today. Um, they are doing very good. My beautiful wife and I, um, I hear something. What's that? It's okay. Yeah, it's Siri. Siri does that sometimes. Um, hello, Jesus. What was that? <laughs> was that the Bible? Oh, we got a chime Bible. That's cool. Yeah. So the family's doing very good. I, I should have given them a picture to share with you. Uh, Henry is coming up to here on me now. I know, and he's a beanpole, and he's so sweet. He, he's so different than what I was at that age. Um, and Zoe is more like I was at that age. She is a little pistol. She's the one I got to watch. She's going to turn seven on Monday, next Monday. Not this Monday, next Monday. And then Clara, just, just all of us are so just... She knows she's the baby, you know, and she just gets so much love and, and, and whatnot. And she's not only walking, she's trying to run, and she's saying her first words. This week she said poopy for the first time, which we were all like, say poopy again. We were like, we loved it. We were like, poopy. Um, <laughs> so exciting times in the Newell household. Um, I got a chance to go to a writer's retreat in France 
I know, I know. Stayed in a 12th century castle in the middle of a region called Dordogne in France. It was a little spooky, I'm not going to lie. First night I had some pretty whack dreams, and then I just woke up at 3 a.m. and took authority <laughs> in Jesus' name, and somebody told me, yeah, there's some weird stuff go that went on in this castle. I'm like, yeah, I, I get that vibe, right? And then uh, Tamara, my dear, uh, got to meet me in Paris. Uh, she's always wanted to go. It was hotter in Paris than it was in Georgia. Yeah. And I booked a room that said air conditioner. <laughs> but let me tell you, the French version of air conditioning compared to ours when it was 99 degrees. And the, the, the hotelier, he was like, Monsieur, I apologize. <laughs> oh, you know, we will give you free breakfast. And we were like, okay, you know, we'll take it. We'll take it. But we, we had a wonderful time just reconnecting the two of us. Um, we've only been married 15 years, but we're getting there. Yeah. Ronnie's boots are more than half my age. Uh, I'm, not gonna, <laughs> I'm not making any comments. I'm just saying <laughs> you, you share that information, not me. <laughs> They're in great shape, as are you, sir. Hats off if I had one. Hats off. This particular scripture jumped out at me, um, really, and I, I just want to kind of read it and go through it. Where's my, I'm always losing my glasses. Here, here, here. I'm like one step away from like needing them on a chain around my neck, you know. I, I refuse to go there, but like my wife is like, come on, like get with it. So uh, verse 21, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then, note this part, one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come, put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Yikes, not fun. She had suffered a great deal under the care of the many doctors. Now that's funny. <laughs> Little Jewish humor there. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body she was freed from her suffering. Verse 30. And at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Come on, Jesus. You see the people crowding again. I was like, what? Jesus. What's Jesus doing again? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? Anybody ever been in New York City at rush hour? <laughs> I used to do it every day, go to Grand Central. Not fun, especially for somebody who doesn't like to really be touched a lot. That's just, you know. And you see the people crowding against you, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it, and then the woman knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people, touch somebody and say some people. Some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead. And they said, why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. And he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the synagogue leader, he saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child's not dead but asleep, but they laughed at him. My, that was a quick shift change. And after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him 
And he went in where the little child was, and he took her by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha Kumai. Her name wasn't Talitha, but that's a nice name if you're having a daughter. Just saying. But it means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them, give her something to eat. This story hits me pretty hard in a lot of different ways because, number one, I am a daddy of little girls, right? There's a daddy with little girls. I got a boy, and I love my boy dearly, 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 but it's different. I don't care what anybody says. Having a little daughter has changed me, made me better, made me softer. I grew up in a kind of zoo with three boys, and I was the, the middle of three boys. And the things that we put this poor woman through, oh, my Lord, I don't know how. But she, look at her. She's laughing now. She, it's, it's all funny now. <laughs> it wasn't then, let me tell you. I remember, uh, God help me, like, she got a brand new couch, this lady. I understand now. I understand. <laughs> I think I tell, said last time I was here, Tamara and I, for some odd reason, decided to get a Napa leather couch with three kids. It wasn't just a few days, and they're like, taking their fingernails and carving pictures into the leather because it's so soft. And I'm like, nah, nah. I remember she got a brand new couch. And for some reason, I don't, I, just, I don't even know, you know, it's like, I, I wish we could still quote Bill Cosby because the whole brain damage bit about kids, it's still so relevant and true and good. And Tamara and I still look at each other and we're like, brain damage. But I took, for whatever reason, I'm walking through the house with my BB gun. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I just decided to throw it and it just went through the side of her brand new cloth couch, brand new. Yeah, yeah. So I get it. Boys, different than girls. But having girls, man, oy, it's a different thing. God has given a, like a heart to fathers for their daughters, right? And uh, like I said, Zoe's, Zoe's a pistol. She's a little bit like me. This new one, Clara, oh my gosh, she's just my... My butter and bread, right? She's so sweet and cute. And uh, our house that we live in, in, in Noonan, Georgia, is a split level. It's not really a two-story. It's a split level. So when you walk in the front door, there's these wooden stairs that go up. There's wooden stairs that go down. So we got a bit of a basement, a bit of another level, and things like that. And because she's just a little toddler, one years old, we have this little gate thing. Right, and we're always close the gate, close the gate. Well, when I went to France with my wife, her parents came down and stayed with the kids. And you know, for me, the biggest thing was like worried about the kids, worried about especially Clara. Clara's a little, blah 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 blah. What if this happens? What you know, the devil just messes with your mind. Blah, blah, blah. We get back, everything's fine, everybody's happy, nothing happened, just like Jesus told me it would be. Right, we're going to church a couple weeks ago. Let's like our first Sunday back. And, you know, Tamara's like making a last minute coffee or something. I've got Henry. I'm, I'm like, I'm going to go to the car. I'll warm it up. Blah, blah, blah. Clara's right holding on to her skirt, right, in the kitchen. And so I'm carrying things in my arms for the day, not thinking. And I go down, and I didn't close the gate. And I am the number one stickler for closing the gate. Because I thought... Clara is with Tamara. She's fine. I make it down, and I'm about to go in the garage, and I hear Tamara go, no, no, no! And I'm like, you know one of those moments where it just things just slow down, and you're like, no. It was one of those, and sure enough, Clara had zipped behind me, unbeknownst to me. Tamara was doing something. I was doing something. I had left the gate open. And she, and, and these are wooden stairs. They ain't soft, right? She tumbled downstairs. Now, she's fine. She was fine. She didn't even really have a bruise or anything, not even a scratch. But us, me, whew, Lord help me. 
it was just one of those moments where you know you 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 and your spouse look at each other and it's like my fault. Yep. 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 And I, I pick Clara up. Tamara had to go walk outside, understandably, because like she could have actually really hurt herself. Um, but she ha she's like a perfect Pete Rose sliding into third base. <laughs> she was fine. Now she was screaming because she was scared, and I was quivering like a leaf. And I was just holding her, shaking, apologizing. I'm sorry, honey. I'm sorry. My fault. My fault. So when I read a story like this of Jairus, I can't help but let my mind go where he is going. Now, you have to understand the cultural context of what is happening here. Because it says clearly at the beginning of the scripture, he was a leader of the synagogue. And I don't know if you got the memo, but Jesus was not so popular with the synagogue crowd. He was not so popular with the Jewish leadership. So clearly this man was desperate and he saw something in Jesus. And he was desperate enough that his daughter was literally on her deathbed, which no 12-year-old should be, but she was. And he saw, I, 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 my religion in this moment is not going to help me. There's only one person that I believe is going to help me in this moment, and that's Jesus. And that's Jesus. My note on that is sometimes God allows us to come to the point of desperation just so that we will come to him. Has anybody ever been there? I feel like it happens to us a lot. Psalm 31, 14, 15 says this, I am desperate, Lord. I throw myself upon you for you alone are my God, my life, my moment, my every moment, my destiny. It's all in your hands. I don't care how long you walk with God. I don't care how decorated you are. If you're the leader of, you know, Timbuktu or whatever, it doesn't matter. There should always be this place in us that is reserved for God that I am desperate for you, God, I am desperate. I have to have your will, not my will be done. Tamara and I had a breakthrough a few years ago where it's like we realized we were so ambitious that our ambitions were overriding our submission to God. And God brought me to this place in 2019. I got laid off three times that year. Yeah. Not fun. Now, was God angry at me? Was he trying to teach me a lesson? I think life will teach you a lesson and God will allow it. I think he wanted us to move and stubborn me wasn't ready to do it. But I tell you this, I got to a place of desperation and surrender. And I said, God, I don't care what you want. I want what you want. Your will be done in my life, in my world as it is in heaven. So my point number one is that Jairus was willing to put his reputation on the line. Do you care more about what people think of you than what God is calling you to do? So Jairus would not have been pop popular. Jesus would not have been popular in Jairus' circle. So for him to step outside of his sphere of influence to come to Jesus would have exposed him to not just ridicule and mockery, but an absolute shift change in his life that could have far-reaching circumstances up to and including getting the boot from the synagogue that he was the leader of. And he was willing to do it. Why was he willing to do it? Isaiah 43, 18. Some of these I'm just going to read fast. So, you know, y'all can reference them or pull them up. But, you know, if, if we don't get to it. You know the scripture. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will make even make a road in the wilderness and, rith and, will blah, 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 and rivers in the desert. It is so easy for us to hold on to what God did back here or the success that we had back here it is so easy to hold on to us thinking that we had something to do with that back here, that we're not willing to let go of something. Why? Because that is so scary for us. We 
if there is a weakness in the human condition is that we are wired for security. On the one hand, it's not wrong. It's, it, it starts in childhood, doesn't it? We were meant to be whole, cherished, nurtured, cuddled, cared for, right? But as we grow up, as we put on our big boy pants and big girl pants, God is calling us to things that are going to often be uncomfortable. And we can't not use the past successes and prosperities as a safety net for where God wants to call us to. So sometimes the insecurity that we experience in this life is actually God doing things. Here's, a, here's another note that God gave me. Sometimes what feels like a demotion is actually the path. Whew. That's what 2019 was for me. You see, leading up to that, I had been praying for a um, sabbatical. I'd always heard the word sabbatical. Oh, sabbatical. That sounds great, right? I remember a minister coming to Raleigh one year. This is many years ago, right when Dad was starting the church. And we were like, well, what you doing here, brother? And he's like, well, I'm on a year sabbatical. It's like, that must be nice. <clears throat> but God gave me 2019. As I surrendered, he gave me that year as a, it was like a year and four months as a sabbatical where he provided for us. Even though I was unemployed for that year, God provided and made a way for us. And it was a wonderful year. It was one of the best for our family. It was, is this mic dying? Yeah? Get a new one or get a battery? Should I grab this one? Test. How is that? Is that all right? Yeah. All right. The wilderness was always meant to be just a path, never a destination. Sometimes you look at your wilderness and you think, God, what are you doing? What have you done? Why am I here? When you have to recognize, sometimes this is just part of the path. And the wilderness is a place where God removes the comfort and he strips away the familiar because he wants us to lean on him. He does not want us to lean on our talent, on our good looks and charm, on our finances. There's nothing wrong with finances, good looks, charm, talent. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you trust that more than Jesus, that's a problem. That is a problem. Hebrews 11, verse 24, it was by faith Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. And it was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt. Not fearing the king's anger, he kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. Now there's a man who had it set and was willing to forego it. So you and I should be. Number two point about Jairus. He was willing to humble himself. What is it, verse 22? It says, when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly. So not only was this dude willing to step outside of his sphere of influence, of his comfortable position in the world, in the eyes of a crowd, you are already established, it's a crowd of people. This would have been the talk of the town, man. This would have been like one of the most important people in the town doing something that could potentially destroy their life as they know it, ruin their reputation, cut off their income. And not only did he, was he willing to approach Jesus, he was willing to get onto his knees and beg. Are you and I willing to be humbled? Now, here's what humility is not. Because there's a lot of false humility floating kind of in Christian doctrine, and it has been for a while, and that's a tactic of the enemy, of course, right? False humility. True humility is not self-flagellation. I'm so worthless, God. I'm such a sinner, God. Why, oh, why did you choose me? That is not humility. Neither is a lack of self-confidence. 
T.D. Jakes used to say, you know, you're a little pack of leather, but well put together. God made you unique and beautiful as you are. And he also said, Jesus said, you know, when you fast, when you do spiritual things, make yourself look good, man. Comb your hair, brush your teeth, look good, man. There's nothing wrong with looking good. So taking that away is not humility. So what is humility, Charlie? Well, I'll give you my de definition. It's so simple. It's a willingness to be taught and to change. It's a willingness to admit, I ain't got all the answers, God, and I need you to show me right here, right now. Is that all right with everybody? James 4, 6 says this, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you. So humility comes before exaltation. Point number three. And this is a big one. <laughs> he didn't, Jairus didn't let others' blessing steal his joy. So think about the flow of the story. I used to wonder, like, well, why, why, why is this story shift? It's like, Jesus, Jairus, humility, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to heal your daughter. And then what happens? The woman with the issue of blood. Now, subtext here in the culture at the time, women were not treated as equals with men back then. And especially a woman who everybody pretty much knew, and it's kind of implied, everybody knew in town this woman had a problem, which under the Hebraic law would have made her unclean. Jairus certainly would have known this, being a leader of the synagogue. And very likely, she was not welcome in the synagogue because of this ailment. And he very easily could have gotten offended in the moment when this woman comes along and interrupts me when I'm in the midst of me going to Jesus and he's going to heal my daughter. I come first. What I want. I got to be honest with you. You ever seen somebody get blessed when you feel like you're in line to get one? Oh, okay. I have. I feel your judgment. It's okay. I forgive you. You're not human if you haven't felt that, right? But God, I have been fasting and praying. But God, I have been seeking you. God, 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 why, why? Jairus would have had kind of the cultural weight backing him had he said, Jesus, this woman's unclean. She's not right. And even the exchange that happened between her and Jesus, it was like inside baseball. What was really going on was really only known between him and her, right? Because of the crowd. Who touched me? Jesus, you're crazy. It's a crowd, right? No, I felt power go out of me. Who did that? Who did that? He stopped everything and said, I have to know who, who came and pulled their miracle out of me today. Her. Her. This woman. People would have known, though. People would have known very fast what was happening. But bless him, Jairus did not get offended in that moment. He didn't let others' blessings steal his joy. And keep in mind, there's a clock in Jairus' head, right? I can imagine when he left his daughter to go to Jesus, she was probably wheezing, gasping, and seeming like this is, this is not good. This is possibly the end. Sometimes, though, and I think the reason why this happened is God lets us witness others' blessing so that we can build faith for ours. See, that's what should actually happen is when we see others experience a blessing, we should take that and be like, if he did it for them, he's going to do it for me because he's no respecter of persons. So when I see people get promoted, blessed, where's Brother Casino? I'm like, that's for me, man. God did it for him. He's going to do it for me. That confession about sales and commissions, man, I, I take that. I got some commissions out there waiting for me right now. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and 
Strength of character develops our confident hope of salvation, and this hope does not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Point number four, Jairus did not let other voices drown out Jesus. Where, what verse is it? It's uh, right at the beginning. I highlighted it. Verse 35, while Jesus was still peak speaking, some people, say that again, say some people. You ever met some people? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You ever met just people? You're like, God, the, those people, some people, man, like they just don't get it. These would have been people from Jairus' inner circle. These would have been people that should have been there for him. These should have been people that realize what he's doing. He's going to Jesus. Maybe Jesus will heal him. What do they do? Some people just love bad news. Some people just like to be that person, right? Sorry to rain on your parade, but your daughter's dead. Not cool. Not cool. And I'm going to be honest with you, had it been me in that position, I would have been standing on the precipice of losing it. I would have been. I want to find that person who said that and just be like, mm, you, you know, Mo Howard, poke to the eyes. Let me tell you about uh, Tamara and I one time. Like, we were engaged to be married. I'm not going to get into a whole engagement. It was, a, it was a big thing with her family, which we're great now. We love each other. It's all good. But, like, back then. So it was a bit of a trial to the point that we had to, like, be like, I was like, Jesus, is, is this your will? Like, am I supposed to marry this girl? Like, right? Because, you know, the tide's kind of against me, Jesus, you know? And uh, we went to this, this conference with our church just outside of New York City in Long Island. And, you know, somebody got up and announced, yeah, Charlie and Tamara, they're engaged. And everybody's like, yeah, people love an engagement, right? And right after, we're doing some mixing and mingling, and this lady just comes up to Tamara and I, and she goes, it's really hard. <laughs> and we're just like, Okay, and I was thinking, yeah, it must be hard being married to you, lady, but no comment. In that moment, we could have taken that into our heart and be like, oh, man, what are we in for? Because we were already having some turbulence at the beginning, not between each other, but with family and stuff like that. But God kept speaking to our heart, no, I'm with this. I'm with you. She's the one. And here we are 15 years later, three kids. It's working out. I'd say it's, it's going pretty well. And I still think she's hot. Well, love her and like her. See, people will tell you that your dream is dead. Like if you were to personalize this, maybe you don't have a daughter, maybe you don't have something, but you have a dream that is on life support and you feel like there's no way. I am, I, I, I've been there more times than I... And outside voices will often tell you, it ain't going to work out, man. I had a boss one time, you know, I work in sales still, but I had a boss for this company, you know, and it translates to sales because I can give good demos and presentations and stuff like that. And he introduced me in this m meeting with a bunch of people, and it's Charlie, he's, he was a British guy, Charlie's, uh, he's a failed actor, but he's really good for us. And I, it was just one of those like... <laughs> Because I, I hadn't yet done much, right, anything. It was before I booked a TV show. Thank you, Martin. Uh, but it's like people will often, you don't even have to invite, <laughs> look for it. They'll find ways to try to pop your balloon, right? What does God say? Ecclesiastes 7, verse 21 says this. This is some really good life advice, by the way. Don't listen to everything people say or you might hear your servant insulting you. <laughs> I thought that was funny. 
let's modernize it. Don't listen to everything you hear people say because your employee might be ridiculing you behind your back, right? I would also caution you, be careful who you tell your dreams to. Be careful. Jeremiah 23, 16 says this. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies say to his people. Do not listen to these prophets when they prophesy to you, filling you with futile hopes. They're making up everything they say. They do not speak for the Lord. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole background of that, but it was a time when people were, you know, calling themselves prophet and things like that. Not totally unlike today where people give themselves a title and think they're good, right? But not everybody is a prophet. I am not a prophet, right? Now, I can prophesy, and I can tap into that, but I am not a prophet. But this was a time in Israel where people were just prophesying flowery dreams, while, all the while idolatry and things were happening in the background, right? So be careful who you tell your dream to, but also be careful who you receive from. Point number five, and this to me is one of the most important points about Jairus' story. Verse 36, or actually verse 35, right at the end it says, Your daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Touch somebody to say, Why bother? Why bother? And that is ultimately the enemy's ploy, is to get that little seed in your brain of why bother? Because it is the seed of hopelessness. And if that seed takes root in your life, then you, your faith will essentially be shut down and you will become ineffective for God and your dream will effectively be dead. And Jairus had a moment where the voices, and you know, there was probably no disputing that his daughter was indeed dead. And all these emotions and things are going through his mind and he's processing what's happening. And he had a moment where he just could have been. I'm done. I've had those moments, friends. I've had those moments before where I'm like, I just, I just can't do this anymore. I'm not saying I was suicidal or anything. I'm just saying like life will beat you up. And the world sometimes will conspire with them and so will the devil. And he had a choice. And what did he do? He kept walking with Jesus. He just kept walking with Jesus. And sometimes there ain't no other secret other than that. Sometimes you hear the doubt. Sometimes you know and feel you're defeated in an area. And Jesus is just saying like he said to him, don't doubt, just believe and keep walking with me. See, because Jesus didn't leave him. It did not change Jesus' plans. Jesus didn't say, oh, well, I guess we're too late. Too bad, Jairus. It would have been a good moment. He could have gotten mad at the lady. Why did you interrupt me? We would have been there by now. There was so much opportunity for offense in that moment. Offense, defeat, and giving up. But he kept walking with Jesus. And my friends, I'm here to tell you, there ain't always going to be fireworks. There ain't always going to be the cavalry coming. And sometimes you're going to have to pick yourself up off the floor and just be like, I don't understand this, Lord, but I'm going to keep walking with you. Can I get an amen on that? That's a good point. Here's a thought that the Lord gave me. Your true belief is in your feet. We used to say people vote with their feet, right? It don't matter what you say to my face. It's your action that comes after that, that reveals what you're really all about. So your real faith is walking with Jesus even when it doesn't seem like it's going right. Intention is nothing, action is everything. Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 5 says this, Who has believed our report? 
And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I, I say it like this. I say, Lord, I flip that and I say, Lord, I believe your report. Therefore, the arm of the Lord is revealed unto me. And we have to get it in our hearts deeply that I'm going to believe the report of the Lord even when circumstances dictate other things. Colossians 2, 6, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. 1 Peter 2, 21, for this, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you as an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Touch somebody and say, keep walking with Jesus. Keep walking with Jesus. And my last point is this. Because of his obedience, because he kept walking, he experienced resurrection power. <sighs> Do you know that the greatest promise in the Bible is that? Is resurrection power? Tamara and I sometimes will, we love Christmas. Anybody love Christmas? I love Christmas. Now the world has made it a big thing which, you know, I'm not going to lie and say I hate it all because, like, the movie Elf, I love that movie. You sit on a throne of lies. I could quote it all day. You're, you don't, you're not Santa. You smell like beef and cheese. Um, he's an angry elf. No, I, I got to stop. <laughs> could you imagine what the world would be like had Jesus never where would we be, man? Not just no Christmas. But what the world doesn't understand is what Christmas represents, not only the birth of Jesus, but the hope of mankind. And with that, resurrection power. But resurrection power is never experienced without So God, sometimes, if we are going to walk with Jesus, we are going to walk through times of death. I'm just going to say it like that. We are going to walk through times where the dream that we thought we had has died. But I'm here to tell you, that moment right there is the point where Jesus steps in with resurrection power. This little girl, Talitha, as I call her, she was no, one of three scriptural examples that Jesus raised from the dead that we know of, that is recorded. So it was a special place of honor. John 11.25 says this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall they live. Though they die, yet shall they live. And here, Philippians 3.10 really underscores this. When Paul was saying, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. See, because it's not only God's intention to take us to the point of death, it's not suffering for the sake of suffering. And this is something that I had to understand in my own life. Because let me tell you, when you lose a job, that's a death. You know, when you got to go home and look at your spouse and be like, don't know where income's happening. Healthcare is ending. Can we uh, budget a little tighter for groceries this month? It's a death, man. It doesn't matter what it is, whatever your dream is. We all experience these death moments. And if we will not get offended at God, if we will keep walking with God, if we will say, Jesus, I don't understand this, but I am willing to follow you to the end, then God will do this. You will know him in the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. And there is a point where we can only really know him in death moments. 
That's why we got to be very careful to not let our circumstances define whether or not God is with us. Oh, my friends, will you stand with me? And let's pray. Um, can I get some keyboards? Thank you, sir. I hope this made sense for somebody. Yeah. I know, I know it makes sense for me, so for if nobody else, uh, I'll take it, my own word. I like to eat my own dog food. Um, but seriously, well, we're going to have the ministry team come forward and pray with you. And look, friends, th these death moments can happen like, they can happen at any time. They can happen sometimes it feels too often where it's just like, God, I feel like I'm not experiencing the dream. Not experiencing. If you are willing to follow the Lord, though, I believe he will take you through to the point of resurrection, power, and life. And so, Lord, we just invite you today. Holy Spirit, we invite you and we submit to you and we are willing to walk with you till the end, Lord, even when it looks like our own dream has died. Even when it feels hopeless, God, even when the voices of others are drowning out my hope, God. Even when I'm seeing others get blessed and I'm tempted to get angry at you for not meeting me now, God. I'm going to surrender to you that we might share in your resurrection power. And so I speak a resurrection word over this body and this people. And I just pray that they would experience that today, Lord God. We just speak breakthrough today, Lord God. We're going to keep walking with you and we are going to honor you in Jesus' name, Lord. If you want prayer, please come forward.